artificial intelligence systems comprise three key components. Uh, there is the algorithms, the, the mechanisms by which the data is analyzed and patterns are found uh, and representative models are created. Uh, the second component is, is obviously the compute power uh, and clearly with the, the emergence of uh, cloud computing, we've now got much more access to computing power that enables us to manipulate the third component, which is, of course, big data. Uh, uh, so with these three components, algorithms, uh, computing power and uh, big data, we've seen this huge growth in the development of AI systems and those AI systems being used to essentially make decisions, whether it be in the commercial sector, whether it be in, the, in our uh, daily uh, lives, whether it be in uh, the criminal justice system, which is the focus of this particular seminar. And um, what I want to focus on in this presentation is uh, how the GDPR impacts on uh, the development of AI systems in the criminal justice system. Uh, and of those three components I highlighted, um, clearly uh, it's not simply about the data. It is also about the algorithms and it's also about the computing power. And so I do want to spend some time, uh, first of all, outlining the scope essentially of the applicable regimes and why those regimes impact not only uh, the data itself, but the algorithms and the uh, computing that underpins the, the processing of AI systems, uh, and therefore why the GDPR impacts essentially every aspect of a deployment of AI within the criminal justice system. So firstly, I just wanted to uh, mention this notion of, of, of big data. Big data is obviously gets a lot of publicity uh, uh, of recent uh, years. Um, its characteristics uh, sometimes talks about the three Vs, volume, value, uh, velocity. Other Vs have been mentioned. So what I'm focusing in on is clearly uh, big data, which is, is personal data. Um, now, if only that was a straightforward characterization of what constitutes um, uh, big data. But, but clearly, uh, even within the notion of personal data under the GDPR, there is not a single categorization. There are uh, different sets of layers, some of which are overlapping. So within the GDPR, we have the, the general notion of personal data which is broadly defined to cover anything that directly or indirectly uh, identifies an individual data subject. So that's the, if you like, the big set within which uh, personal data um, is regulated. And it's, it's always important to, to recognize that not all jurisdictions necessarily, not all jurisdictions outside of Europe necessarily define personal data in the same way. For example, within the United States, they often use the term personally identifiable information. And by that, they tend to mean a narrower concept of personal data uh, which directly identifies an individual uh, rather than the indirect um, extension that is provided for under the GDPR. So we have this big set of personal data. Within that, though, we have a second category of data, which is generally referred to as sensitive personal data. Uh, and sensitive personal data is a, is a subset of personal data, but it's a subset which is subject to more substantial controls because of a perception that that data is somehow more sensitive and therefore going to potentially give rise to greater harms. Now, the way the GDPR talks about this type of data is it refers to it as special categories of data. Uh, and lists a whole series of data items, which include data about your sexual or health life, data about your political or religious beliefs. What it doesn't include, though, is data about criminal convictions and offences. So one could immediately think, well, OK, so if we're going to deploy AI systems within the criminal justice system, we need to think about whether it is personal data or sensitive personal data. And on 
the immediate face, it would appear that data referring to the most obvious aspect of, of the criminal justice system, the investigation, uh, prevention and, and detection of, uh, and enforcement of crime, then uh, that sort of data would appear, doesn't fall in uh, what is known as these special categories of data. But of course, that's, that's underestimating uh, the scope of, of the GDPR. And in fact, data concerning somebody's criminal convictions and offences is subject to its own provision. And although it's not referred to as special categories of data, it clearly falls within this subset of sensitive data to which there are more strict controls over the processing and the use of such data. The third category is personal, uh, pseudonymized data, uh, pseudonymized personal data. And this is personal data over which security controls have been exercised. And the purpose of those security controls is essentially to try and reduce the vulnerability of that data uh, to, being, uh, to being subject to um, some sort of uh, abusive use. Uh, so personal, pseudonymized personal data remains within the regime, but it is again a, a category, categorization of data or characteristic of data, which uh, gives rise to differential uh, regulatory obligations because the pseudonymization process makes that data more secure and therefore uh, some of the obligations or some of the concerns about the use of that data uh, are, are somewhat reduced. A final category, and, and here I'm getting into more controversial areas, is the notion of, uh, of anonymized data. Now, anonymized data is clearly, if you like, taking pseudonymization one step further, because what it does not allow is you to reverse engineer that data back into a form that allows you to identify an individual either directly or indirectly. I put it here because it is a controversial issue about how effective anonymization techniques are. And in fact, of course, one of the, 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 the benefits, one of the uh, possibilities of using AI systems is the ability to combine a range of different data sets, bring them together and actually achieve results, recognize patterns, uh, make determinations that were not possible in an environment where you had limited data sets and where you had limited computing power, as well as uh, less powerful algorithms. So the systems that we're concerned with in this conference, AI systems for the criminal justice system, the, the power that they can deploy actually can endanger reliance upon a set of data as being anonymized, because once it is placed within the system, by the, the nature of the system may actually ena enable re-identification. So I always put anonymization, anonymized data within this categorization of personal data, because the question of whether it is or is not truly anonymized and therefore outside of the regime may depend on the nature of the system, the nature uh, over time, uh, so it'll have a temporal component uh, and, and therefore it is always worth identifying that data which although you think is outside may simply uh, become personal data at some future time. So we all recognize that in our modern environment we have huge amounts of personal data uh, and that personal data is subject to data protection regimes uh, and those data protection regimes are most clearly developed within the European Union. Uh, the European Union uh, had a directive, has had a directive since 1995. Uh, that directive was repealed and replaced by the GDPR, but often people forget that the, there is a second data protection directive, Directive 0258, which deals with um, privacy and electronic communications. Uh, and People forget about this directive, although one has to be honest, probably for most people, if not uh, the majority of the general public, 
perceive this directive on a daily basis in a way that they probably don't necessarily perceive the GDPR. And the most obvious example is cookie banners. Cookie banners that really annoy us and get in the way and, and have to be clicked or read or agreed to. Those cookie banners arise under the Directive 0258, not under the General Data Protection uh, Regulation. I'd also mention uh, the Charter on Fundamental Rights, which in, tr embodied a right to data protection in uh, European Union law, and the GDPR, which, which many, or hopefully everyone, will, uh, will have heard of. If you, if you haven't heard of the GDPR, uh, then um, uh, it's a, a serious issue that you need to, uh, to consider. So, Personal data is one aspect of our uh, conception. The second is, is the nature of profiling. And in fact, the GDPR specifically defines uh, this notion of profiling uh, in um, uh, the GDPR as a process by which you evaluate data to either analyze past or predict future behaviors. So it is absolutely clear that GDPR has AI decision-making systems well within its sites. It's not a generalized regime of which you have to simply consider how AI systems for the criminal justice system will be impacted by GDPR. The GDPR is very expressed in its capture of certain aspects of uh, the processing of personal data within the criminal justice system. That said, however, it is important to bear in mind that when the GDPR was adopted in 2016, it had a, uh, there was a second instrument that was adopted uh, by the European institutions on the processing of, of personal data for the prevention, investigation, detection and prosecution of criminal offences or the execution of criminal penalties. Now, this directive, 2016-680, is targeted at the competent authorities, the state entities which carry out those activities and gives them the right to collect, process and utilise personal data for the purposes of the uh, prevention, investigation, detection and prosecution of criminal offences. So if you are involved in the criminal justice system, not only do you have to think about the boundary issue that exists about what is personal data, the second boundary issue you have to consider is which regime, which data protection regime is applicable to the type of processing that I'm engaged in. So, for example, if you are a competent authority engaged in the investigation of criminal activity, then the GDPR is not the applicable instrument. The applicable instrument is a directive, Directive 2016-680, and that directive, as a directive, has to be transposed into to, to national law. So this may be done under a single instrument, such as in the United Kingdom. The Data Protection Act 19, uh, 2018 encompasses both the GDPR implementation, but also the implementation of that specific directive. However, if you are involved in the criminal justice system and you are processing personal data for purposes other than the prevention, detection, investigation and prosecution of criminal offences, then the GDPR is applicable. So it's purpose driven. So you, when thinking about how you are intending to deploy AI within the criminal justice system, you need to make decisions about what purposes you are intending to deploy that system and the purpose will determine whether you are subject to the directive as a competent authority or whether you are subject to the GDPR. So, for example, public security, you may be processing data for the purposes of public security, but it's not specifically for the prevention, investigation, detection and prosecution of criminal offences. The GDPR is applicable. So your second boundary issue is to determine which data protection regime is applicable. Now, data protection law is subject to a set of overriding principles. And those principles are designed to be applicable in every environment of data processing, and therefore will be equally applicable to the processing of personal data in a criminal justice context as they would in 
uh, a commercial context. And there are essentially six uh, uh, data protection principles that are that are uh, elaborated here. Um, the, the, the first is that of lawfulness. Uh, lawfulness, fair, fairness and transparency. And when we talk about lawful uh, processing, uh, we have to think both about lawfulness in a positive sense as well as in a negative sense. When I, when I talk about a positive sense, uh, what we have to do is decide you know, what is the criteria that justifies the processing of this personal data. And under the GDPR, there are a limited number of justified reasons for lawfully processing personal data, from data protections, data subjects consent, to the notion of legitimate interests. But, as I've already said, um, data about criminal convictions and offences are a form of sensitive personal data. And although personal data can be processed lawfully on a number of different criteria, six different criteria. To process data about criminal convictions and offences, you can only lawfully process that data on the basis of union or member state law. So consent is not applicable. Uh, contract is not applicable. You can't make an argument for legitimate interests because legitimate interests are not, in fact, available to public authorities. You can only process data in respect of uh, criminal uh, convictions and offences with express authorisation in law. Secondly, there is a negative connotation to, to lawful, and essentially that negative connotation is you can't process that personal data if it's in breach of a legal obligation. So, for example, if you are subject to a duty of confidentiality, that duty, if that duty is breached in the processing operation, then again, it is unlawful processing and you have to stop. Within the context of public authorities, the most obvious example of a negative uh, legal obligation is that of virus, whether you have the power as uh, a, a, an authority to actually process data for that purpose. If you don't have the necessary vires, if you are acting ultra vires, fundamental principle of, of administrative law, even if you have a lawful basis for the processing, a positive lawful bas basis for the processing, it would still be unlawful processing. So it's always important to bear in mind both the positive and negative concepts of, uh, uh, of uh, lawful processing. I'll be coming back to fairness and process, uh, transparency in a moment, so I won't say any more about that at, uh, at the current time. The second data protection principle is that of purpose limitation. You collect the data for one purpose and or a number of purposes, but those purposes are made known to the data subject upon collection, and you are prohibited from processing that personal data for an incompatible secondary purpose. And again, Within the GDPR, specific references re made to criminal convictions and offences when considering whether a secondary purpose is compatible or otherwise. And clearly, the, 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 what the GDPR is essentially arguing is that because of the sensitive nature of criminal conviction and offence data, uh, it is highly the threshold of compatibility is very high. And therefore, you shouldn't assume just because, oh, that it would be great to be able to deploy this AI system against this other purpose, that other purpose um, cannot be assumed to be compatible because of the sensitive nature of the data itself. A third aspect is the notion of data minimization. And, and the notion of data minimization almost is a complete counterpoint to our notion of um, big data. Uh, big data essentially tells us that we, we want to collect as much, much personal data as we possibly can, uh, whereas um, what is clear from, what is, what is clear from um, uh, the data protection principles is we should only be collecting that data which is necessary for the purposes for which we are carrying it out. Uh, so again, that principle is applicable 
uh, would be as applicable to, to data in a criminal justice context, context as it would be within um, a commercial context. And in fact, these data protection principles are equally applicable uh, both under the GDPR and under Directive uh, 680, uh, 2016-680. The notion of data minimization is actually further elaborated within the within the GDPR through obligations upon controllers, those pro setting up AI systems to, to design data protection into the system and by default to try and minimize the collection of personal data. And the reason why I mention this is it goes back to my starting comment, which is you have to bear in mind that the GDPR is not only concerned with the data, but it's also concerned with the algorithms and it's also concerned with the computing power. GDPR affects all of those, the, all, all three components of AI systems. It affects the algorithm because the algorithm is essentially processing data in a way that is designed to you know, uh, maximize uh, the collection and the processing of personal data. It's a breach of the principles. If the uh, data protection system, you know, the computing system retains data for long periods of time, although it's no longer necessary, that system design is a breach of the data minimization principle. So we always have to bear in mind the GDPR is not just about the data. It's about the systems that process it. It's about the algorithms that manipulate it. The fourth principle is that of, of accuracy and the right to rectification. Um, also, you'll be aware of notions of the right to be forgotten, which is which is a separate right. Uh, and I mention it in the context of AI systems and the criminal justice system because we have in many legal systems this no, notion of the rehabilitation of offenders, the notion that your conviction after a certain period of time uh, becomes essentially spent and should be wiped from um, your criminal record. But of course, your criminal record is only one manifestation of where that data may appear. That data may also appear in, for example, a local newspaper or maybe found through searching on Google. So um, the GDPR regime provides mechanisms that go beyond simply the, the holder of the original data, but its manifestations within different environments uh, and allows uh, allows both the correction of data and also if you combine that with the notion of data minimization, your ability to, uh, the, the ability of data subjects in certain circumstances to get that data, to, data removed. Linked to that is of course uh, storage limitation. Um, here I would simply mention that Although the general rule is you shouldn't retain the data for any longer than possible than, than necessary, uh, there are a rec there is a recognition that for certain archiving, scientific, historical research or statistical purposes, the continued storage and the processing of that data may be perfectly appropriate because of the essentially because of the public interest benefits that may accrue from that archiving, scientific research and st statistical. Uh, analysis and so again this will be potentially highly relevant to deployments of AI in the criminal justice system because of that possibility of actually retaining either the data itself or the data generated by that data for, for periods that go beyond um, simply the, the initial purpose. However that data needs to be safeguarded because it obviously represents a vulnerability and we get back to this notion of, of, of pseudonymization. Finally, uh, we have uh, integrity and confidentiality, uh, and that's you know, clearly about uh, maintaining data from accidental, unauthorized or unlawful access. It's relevant, it's, it's a particular relevance within, within the context of this seminar because of course, being sensitive data, your obligations to maintain that data securely are enhanced compared to other types of personal data. As well as these data protection principles, there is essentially a, a, a seventh principle, if you like, and that seventh principle is the principle of accountability. And what that principle essentially says is it's not just about being subject 
to an obligation to comply with the principles, but you must be able to demonstrate that compliance. Um, and of course, that leads to very substantial record keeping requirements essentially being imposed upon um, uh, data controllers. And again, it's important to design that into the system. Because if you design an AI system for a criminal justice context and you don't think about your ability to meet your accountability obligations, then you are essentially exposing yourself to um, uh, regulatory intervention, uh, review, and potential, uh, potential constraints being placed upon you. So it is really important that data protection isn't considered to be a sort of add-on to the design of an AI system. It has to be built into the system, not only to meet the, the principles such as data minimization and accuracy and security, but also the seventh notion of accountability. Can I go back and find that I, can I go back and demonstrate that I have complied with those data protection principles? And under the GDPR, that accountability principle is, is elaborated through notions of the need to keep records of processing and through the notion of, of what are known as data protection impact assessments. Um, these data protection impact assessments are essentially, if you like, a, uh, an, uh, an ex-ante obligation to consider data protection with the design and implementation of the system. It, it sort of builds on my, the point I've already made that accountability is about making sure you design in uh, data protection compliance rather than bolt on such compliance. And the GDPR under Article 35 is very clear that where you are processing on a large scale personal data relating to the criminal convictions and offences of individuals, you have to, you shall, carry out a data protection impact assessment. So it's not a nice, it's a must have. Linked to that, um, uh, however, a potential exemption from that is where um, an impact assessment has been carried out as part of a, uh, as part of the adoption of the legal basis for the processing. What do I mean by that? If you remember, I said that Data about criminal convictions and offences are essentially a category of sensitive data. As that category of sensitive data, the only lawful basis for processing is under member state or European Union law, but let's focus on member state law. So there has to be a law that permits that sort of processing. Now, when that law was adopted, in many jurisdictions, certainly within the United Kingdom, there will be a, an impact assessment that, that looks at a range of factors, including the potential um, for uh, infringements of people's privacy and other fundamental rights. And what the GDPR says is if that impact assessment has been carried out in the course of adopting the law that authorises the processing, then there is no need to carry out another data protection impact assessment because it is assumed that the uh, general legislative impact assessment should meet the needs uh, under GDPR. So that's a very important exception with regard to carrying out the data protection impact assessments that, that may be applicable to a number of AI systems within the criminal justice environment. And finally, where those impact assessments are carried out, of course, if the result is a high risk, there is a high risk of an individual's personal data being, being uh, used in a way that, that infringes somebody's, uh, that person's uh, fundamental rights, then there needs to be some sort of prior consultation. So it is not a, simply about designing into the system the ability to deal with this, but it's also about uh, your ability to um, uh, your ability to um, uh, consider whether you have essentially consulted with the regulatory authority, and that and, and that's the key. It's about uh, not only designing the system, but it may be about getting prior consultation, and a, not approval. They can't, they can't, they can't, it's not a prior authorization regime, but it is a prior consultation mechanism. And as we can all imagine, if you consult and the regulator thinks that the mechanism is inappropriate, 
you can continue you're not uh, it's because it's not an authorization scheme but i wouldn't recommend it uh, in terms of uh, compliance uh, and and making sure the regulator leaves you alone so i've already talked about the fact that the gdpr affects all aspects of the an ai system the the algorithm the data and and, and the computing um, and of course ai decision making is about the power of machines to essentially to identify patterns to make evaluations and and to to make predictions that's exactly the the purpose of using ai within any environment but, but particularly within the criminal justice system whether it be about potential future uh, criminal activity or whether it be about you know your ability to be released from jail or whether it be about sentencing decisions all of the the, the myriad of of different applications that we'll be talking about over the next uh, day and a half of this seminar is all about identifying patterns, making evaluations and, and, and predictions that are based on this. And, and, uh, and clearly what AI systems enables us to do, the power is to, is to process that personal data and get ever more personalized results. Uh, but of course that creates its own paradox because the more personalized the result, the more potential harm it creates uh, to the individual uh, or potential for harm and therefore uh, it, and it also fails, it fails to take into account some of the more social uh, aspects that exist where you don't narrow down uh, to an single individual but you essentially uh, average out populations or, or, or use a population-based statistics. So clearly the concern with AI and decision making is to, ex to the extent I mean, there's two aspects. One is, can AI decision making identify and disregard traditional human bias, prejudice, stereotyping, or other factors that can impinge on the appropriate uh, on decision making in the in the traditional environment? You know, the the surveys that show that if you are coming before a judge before he's had his lunch or he, he or she's had his her lunch, then you are more likely to get a severe sentence than you are if you get sentenced after lunch, where uh, the judge has had perhaps time for a meal, the, the blood sugar levels uh, fall, and essentially they become somewhat more lenient. I mean, the, the evidence is clear that for a whole range of reasons, our wonderful judiciary, however wonderful they may be, are human beings and therefore are subject to the whole range of um, uh, bias, prejudice, stereotyping, and clear chemical activity that, that everybody else is susceptible to. And therefore, um, the question for AI systems is through the data that is input into the system through the technical bias built into the algorithm or, or, or bias that emerges over the operation of the system to what extent will ai embody those biases prejudices and stereotypes or to what extent they can identify and therefore disregard such uh, bias uh, and that's really a key key debate i mean we hear a lot in um, the the media about systems where bias is being reiterated within AI. Uh, but clearly, from a design perspective, what we're trying to do is to remove all those human failings and try and achieve a, an environment in which AI's decision making is much better than uh, human uh, decision making because it doesn't get tired, it doesn't have lunch, it doesn't um, have an inbuilt bias against a particular race or a particular uh, age group or a particular uh, sexual orientation and therefore we have better decision making and we're at this cusp at the moment the public consciousness is one of of, of you know building those biases through the data we put in through the technology that we use or emerging through the operation of the systems what we clearly want to get to is an environment in which AI has that ability to identify and disregard bias. But of course, um, that it, we, we are not there at the moment. And in fact, the way in which the, the GDPR is currently drafted, it exhibits really that, that public perception that AI simply may be 
a worse form of human decision making. And we see that through Article 22 of the GDPR, which is the right against automated decision making. Now, this right is not new. It was in the previous directive. So uh, we've, we've, we've had it as part of the European law since uh, 1995. And what it essentially provides for is a right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. And of course, <coughs> that, uh, I, I think, immediately shows the bias. We are distrustful of our systems and therefore we need to have a process by which we can require a human in the loop. We have to have some mechanism by which we can appeal to a human. Um, what, what that means is not particularly further elaborated within the article itself, but guidance issued by uh, the European Data Protection Board does elaborate uh, what, what, how much human should be placed in the loop. It talks about the need for meaningful oversight. It talks about the need for the person that, that is in the loop to have the necessary authority and the competence to change the decision. And it says that person must also give consideration to all the relevant data. So it is quite a high threshold that is placed upon that human in the loop. And so that creates two issues for those designing and deploying AI systems in the criminal justice system. One is to what extent you build that human in the loop in the first place. Uh, and secondly, to what extent that human intervention is sufficient to meet the threshold requirements of, of having the authority, having access to the relevant data. And of course, having access to the relevant data also includes information about how the algorithm operates to produce a particular result. And this right is limited to two circumstances where a decision uh, produces a legal effect, and where the dis or where the decision significantly affects an individual. So there is a threshold for this right. It's not every decision. If this right was applicable to every decision, essentially AI would you know, become less and less um, efficient in the way it is deployed. It is only a right that can be exercised in circumstances where the decision produces a legal effect, for example, entering into a contract, being subject to a particular sentence, or significantly affects an individual. Significantly affects an individual. What constitutes significant effect, obviously, is an issue up for debate. Um, you could say that if I fail to be offered um, a particular discount because I'm not considered to be that sort of customer, is that really a significant effect? But within the criminal justice system, it is much easier to identify the fact that decisions made by AI systems are likely, you know, the presumption must be that they are likely to have a significant effect on the individual. So that's the right. Importantly, though, it's subject to certain exemptions. Uh, and those exemptions depend on the lawful basis. So if the lawful basis for the processing is that of law, then the right doesn't come into existence. And so uh, that right not to be subject to an automated decision is not we should not generally be applicable in circumstances where we're dealing with um, the processing of personal data about criminal convictions, uh, uh, criminal convictions and, and offences because we can only process that criminal conviction and uh, data on the basis of authorization by member state law and that member state law essentially exempts us from that obligation uh, that right uh, of an individual not to be subject to a decision so again depending on how what data is being used clearly i mean it's not always going to be criminal convictions and, and offenses for which the criminal justice system is processing data but to the extent that it is then the right is essentially not applicable to the data subjects that are subject to, to, to that system. Um, 
and it goes back to this this general point I was making about the notion of AI systems either reflecting our bias, prejudice, and stereotypes, or essentially being able to go beyond that and offer something that is is different. And, and that is part of the, the, the most fundamental debate about the nature of, of AI systems in general. Do they essentially uh, replace our ability to make autonomous decisions or are they or, or are they simply um, are they simply uh, enhancing our ability to make uh, autonomous decisions? Given the time, I just want to move on to the next issue that, that which which is which is that of, of, of fairness. Uh, and here, uh, the issue is clearly um, uh, the link to this this notion of bias is this this concept that somehow if we utilize AI, uh, it will lead to discrimination and it will lead to unfair treatment. And of course, the point I make in the the, the first bullet is, is is of course not all correct decisions are necessarily lawful uh, and an example of that arising from essentially an ai type of system was a case in 2011 concerning uh, the right of women drivers to get cheaper insurance the, the data analysis clearly shows that women are safer drivers and therefore uh, may be discriminated in favor of in terms of car insurance but the european court of justice said that nature of discrimination although it may be a correct portrayal of the world was unlawful as a form of discrimination. So we need to bear in mind that, that, that when our, the decision making that our AI systems are being asked to make, they may be correct decisions, but just because they're correct decisions doesn't mean they're lawful decisions. And I think that's a very important uh, component to bear in mind when thinking about um, how we deploy AI within a criminal justice system. And of course, a lot of that's to do with with the input data as i've already said input bias comes from bad data therefore the quality the quantity and the way in which we label the data data becomes critical in meeting our data protection obligations on the one hand but also this this fundamental notion of fairness that underpins is is, is part of this first data protection principle <coughs> um but of course Fairness has this overriding connection with, with notions of ethics as well. And um, part of the, the, the public policy debate that exists about AI and criminal justice systems is, is to what extent it is almost unethical not to process personal data, to extract information that may help us to predict, prevent, detect, and act against those engaged in criminal activity against us. Uh, and the GDPR does, within its within its its nature, both as a separate instrument, but also that second directive I talked about, tries to, to make that balance between the public interest in preserving the personal data uh, and the, the public interest in utilizing that data for, for, for another purpose. And, uh, and that comes back to this whole notion of, of, of justice and fairness. Um, uh, again, the, 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 the bullet point I made there on the slide, AI, AI objectivity could be seen as good because it removes the bias that I've already talked about, but it can also be seen as bad to the extent that it doesn't necessarily reflect some of the, 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 the empathy that a jury may evidence or discretion that a, that a judge may exercise, which we would recognize as a critical component of, of, of a, a just legal system, but is, is not exactly feasible within an AI um, implemented system. So the point I would leave you with there is, of course, it's not simply about this, this I mean, the point I've already made about um, uh, about uh, trying to to identify and disregard bias. The point I would make is it's also a matter about thinking about to what extent, if we remove that bias, does that somehow undermine our notion of justice and therefore our notion of fairness? Okay, transparency is the third and final component I wanted to quickly refer to. Um, 
General Data Protection uh, Directive requires two types of um, transparency. Uh, on the one hand, prior notification. So we should be told where an AI system is being used to make a automated decision about us. We should be told about its existence. We should be told about the significance of the decision that it's being made, that is being made, and the consequences for the data subject. So, you know, important information has to be provided prior to the collection or at the point of collection of data protection. On the other hand, we also have uh, post access rights, uh, whereby again, we should be given um, information about the existence of an automated decision, information about the meaningful logic that underpins uh, uh, and, and significant, uh, significance and the consequence. So, Again, it's about ensuring that GDPR is considered not only you know, in the design of the system, but also the collection of the personal data that underpins that system. Because if you don't have the necessary transparency, whether you get it from the data subject or from a third party, then there are potential obligations to go back to that data subject to give them the necessary information. And of course, this brings us to this sort of general issue about uh, to what extent uh, should we and can we explain what happens in the black box? Uh, why do we have to explain what's in the black box? Well, under data protection law, we have to do it because it's part of my ability to exercise my individual rights. What do I have to explain? Well, I have to explain what is the meaningful, I have to explain meaningful information about the logic involved. That means I've got to know about the logic involved. That means I can't just deploy an algorithm without understanding uh, the parameters and the decisions that it's going to make. When? Well, as I said, you have to explain that meaningful logic either on an ex-ante or an ex-post basis uh, to the individual data subject to enable them to exercise their rights. I'll go, uh, I will finish here because I'm uh, gone uh, beyond time, but I just want to, 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 to finish uh, by, uh, again, stressing the fact that um, data protection issues, not just the GDPR, GDPR is the emb emblematic manifestation of data protection, but it's not just the GDPR. Data protection issues impact all aspects of AI decision making systems within the criminal justice system. It affects the data, what sort of data you're processing, it, it, it affects the algorithms, how are you processing it, what purposes, and it, it, it impacts the, 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 the computing. Where are you processing that data? Earlier this year, the, the Privacy Shield was struck down, uh, which makes the exchange of data or the, placing data in the United States much more difficult in terms of compliance. So we have to bear in mind always uh, every aspect of AI systems within the criminal justice system are directly or indirectly impacted by data protection law. Thank you very much indeed.